This is a pod. A pod about dogs. Hey everyone, welcome to the Healthy Dog Pod. It's Sophie and Ian as always. Hello. And today we have a guest in. We have Nikki Stevens from Sydney Dog Training. Hey Nikki. Hi. So tell us a little bit about Sydney Dog Training and how you got started and yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm originally from the UK. Um, and I pretty much got into dog training or looking into behavior when I was about 19. Um, I started out, I've always owned dogs, always loved dogs. Um, grew up with um, all sorts of breeds, Great Danes, um, a good old mongrel. Um, and then when I was 19, I was working as an animal care assistant at a local veterinary surgery. And we, um, our poodle, we had a miniature, we had a toy poodle actually um, called Amber Pickle. And Amber right. was a... Hang on a second. <laughs> Tell us about why Amber. <laughs> That's my mother's fault. Um, so she had always wanted an amber-coloured poodle, and she couldn't get one. She got a white one, and she decided that his name's going to be Amber, even though he's a boy. His middle name will be Pickle, because that was his father's name, and we wanted to inherit the father's name and you know, keep it in the family. I love it. And so we had Amber Pickle, um, and he was... He was a nightmare, and he was um, the reason that I got into um, dog behavior because anything that can go wrong did in the fact that we set this dog up to fail. And so I was very interested. When I got to 19, you know, he was about 16 years old by that point. He was in my life, such a large um, part of my life. But he um, he was miserable, and we um, eventually had him uh, put to sleep because his health had de- deteriorated. Um, and it was only then when I was actually working in the animal industry that I started to think, what happened here? Um, what sort of things were going wrong? He was extremely aggressive. So he had severe resource guarding. Um, he would, if you took a sock off, he would go um, and he would pounce out from nowhere, take that mm-hmm. sock. Ninja. And he would go into a space where he could be protected. So he'd get under a bed or behind a couch. And he would scream at this sock for hours. If you walk past the couch, he would snarl, growl. He would even attack the sock. He would, like, clinch it between his paws, and he would spend hours there, even to the point where he wouldn't eat because I think he was convinced we were trying to, well, we were, we were trying to lure him over with food. Um, and he would do this with anything on the floor. It meant that he couldn't have toys. Um, he, he was resource aggressive with food, um, even with his own bed. So if you walked past his bed and he wasn't even on it, he would run to the bed and just start attacking it and screaming at it. Um, if you stood by the front door or the, any door, he would attack the bottom of the door. So the door had teeth marks and it was all the wood had chipped where he'd attack it. Um, he was very, very, very unstable. Okay. Um, and he was like that for a long time. He would pee on people if they came in. He would pee on the bed. Um, and there was times where he would be guarding something under my bed. Um, I'm the scruffy one in the family. So there was always something on the floor in my room. Um, clean, but scruffy. And so he would find something in there, go under my bed, and we would have to almost ambush him in a really kind of, it's, it's, it's twisted really, but we'd have to lift the mattress so we could see him under the, under the bed. And then one of us would have to prod him with like the mop or something so that he would turn on the mop so that we could then grab the object. And then once the object was gone, he was almost like he came out of a trance and he kind of went out of the room. Um, but it meant though for years, we, we, our interaction became less and less with this dog because he was unpleasant to be around because he was compulsive as well. So he would obsessively um, chew his own paws to the point where he would bleed, chew his legs. He was just, he was almost a textbook of things to not do with your dog, not to allow that to happen with your dog. And it only really came to light years later when I started to look into this and try and backtrack and figure out like what the heck happened to poor Amber Pickle. Um, and even to the point where his aggression, he was, um, he had to be sedated to even have what we used to call the full MOT. He would basically have to go into the vet to have his ears clean, have his, his glands squeezed, have everything done, his nails clipped. He'd have to be sedated for that because he was just um, a very frightened dog in the veterinary centre. He was frightened from other, other dogs outside. So he was very insecure, but in the house he was very aggressive. Yeah. And it was hard. Um, and so it was really about me trying to backtrack and go, whoa, what yeah. did we do wrong? And pretty much everything. <laughs> and that's, I think a lot of people misunderstand that because they see aggression as the overriding presenting problem and assume, you know, with the old myths and crap, like about dominance. And 
oh, my dog's so dominant and all that. And insecure and dominant don't even, they don't marry up very well, do they? Yeah. And it's clearly driven by insecurity. And this is why we say um, a dog has practiced aggression and become confident that that behavior works as a coping mechanism, but it doesn't, it's not a confident dog. So you don't treat it as such. You don't treat it as a confident, um, like trying to reduce its confidence as your training method. You that that if, it, if that's presented, then that's way too late to be addressing it. You go and treat the underlying issue. And um, yeah, I'm assuming this is where you're going with this. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so yeah. So when I kind of did my, I'd say my analysis or my retrospective, really for me. Um, it was clear that he didn't have um, some really um, fundamental things. So he didn't have boundaries. Um, he was often praised for just being so damn adorable, and that was it. You know, he was adorable at times, and other times he was Satan. But he would be um, just—he was mummy's little baby, and and that was my mum. And so she um, she brother. won't mind me admitting this. She is um, she is a very good disciplinarian with her children. She's quite you know she gives me the look, and that's all I need. But when I, when it comes to animals, she's such a pushover. And she would give them whatever they want, even if what they want isn't isn't good for them. And so he had no boundaries. He had um, very, in fact, he had no training, nothing. There's no language to, to connect us with him. He didn't understand what we wanted. In fact, he never, we never wanted anything from him. We didn't want to train him. He was sometimes very difficult to be with. Um, and he had very little stimulation. And so for me, that was the biggest part, is he was so damn bored that his day was spent staring at a sock screaming at a sock because that's the best way he could busy his mind. And over the years, as not having, you know, back in that time, you didn't have access to the resources you have now. We didn't have the knowledge. We didn't have, um, you, you know, I didn't, I'd never heard of a dog trainer close by you, you call. And we didn't have the finances for it either. And so at the time, all that stuff just wasn't an option. And in all honesty, I don't believe that we thought that we were um, creating this environment for him. We thought there's something wrong with our dog um, and we didn't really correlate that it was us. Um, and so for me, that's where it all began. I started to really understand more about it. Um, I did some study and I um, I really kind of got into understanding aggression um, and anxiety and those types of things. Um, I then moved on from um, a veterinary surgery um, to moving into just an admin role and I hated it, but I was in it for seven years. And eventually I got a job as a shelter duty manager for an RSPCA in Southport in the north of England. Um, nice and place. it was an amazing, amazing experience, but it was a short one. Um, so my job was running the day-to-day -day operations of the animal shelter. And that's where I really became interested in rescue um, and understanding like the strains that a shelter is under and the, Im the immense um, work that they have to do just to get these animals fed and watered and very little else. There's not much time for anything else. There's no time to work on behavioural. Really um, stretch resources. It's, 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 it's a, real, a real shame. Um, and so that's where I started to really learn a little bit more about that experience and understanding more about res um, rescues. Um, but that was short-lived. It wasn't the right environment for me. Um, and I went back into... <coughs> 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 Sorry. <coughs> I was trying to hold it. Oh, don't hold it. It makes like, it worse. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, stop, stop, stop. Oh, my sorry, God. sorry. That's okay. <coughs> All right. Sorry, continue on. Yeah. <laughs> it's fine. Um, so it was short lived. It wasn't the right environment for me. And I um, I went back into um, into an admin type. Well, I went into IT. Um, and then five years ago, I came to Sydney and a friend of mine had a uh, puppy. And was like, oh god, this dog's like crazy, it bites my feet, and it's doing all these things. Um, and I just said, oh, I'll try this, try that. And I said, oh, can you come around and can you help me? And and then from there, it started to uh, become a thing that I was helping people with their dogs. Um, and I was getting such a kick out of it because people were like, oh god, you're like a yeah, some dog kind of. Well, I didn't want to say that. <laughs> I know. I hate being called it. <laughs> me too. Yeah. I almost find it offensive. I'm like, yeah. oh, mate. <laughs> <laughs> but it was getting that kind of thing and it was just such simple stuff and it was really from that that I realized wow what I think is simple and obvious isn't to many people and so um, I started to uh, I got a website I started to do a bit more study and I actually got a job at, um, with a dog training company in Australia and I was doing weekend puppy classes um, and I decided eventually um, I can do this myself in my own way and um, yeah and I started my own Sydney dog training 
Oh, good work. Yeah, that was about two years ago now. Okay, awesome. Mm. And so, are you? What are the areas that you focus on as a trainer? Like, what with your what are your strengths? Um, I tend to look at really basic things. So I um, just knowing that that's what we didn't do with our dog. I'm I'm such a, an advocate of the fundamentals of the real basic obedience, um, setting up the environment in the right way, um, consistency, that type of thing. And so I tend to prefer to focus on basics. Um, I'm really just working with my clients to understand what is it you want to achieve from owning a dog, and what you know, what does a happy dog look like to you? Um, I do sometimes get involved in aggression, um, but as you both know, it's 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 not a solvable problem in the sense that it's a manageable problem. And so um, quite often, I first thing I say to a client when I when they call me and they're saying my dog's attacking other dogs in the park. As I say, show me how they can sit or show me how they can stay. Tell me what basics they have. What have you built? What are the foundations for this dog? Um, and quite often, my clients sometimes can be a bit confused as to why are we talking about basic obedience when he's you know, trying to take the head off the dog down the street. Um, but for me, it's the place to start. You have to build that language, that common language between the two. You've got to build some impulse control. You've got to be able to... Um, have a conversation with your dog without speaking their language, and so got to be able to communicate. Absolutely. It's like um, listening to that story about Amber Pickle. Um, <laughs> great name still. Um, <laughs> the uh, I think so many people do this is we'll take it in and we'll love it and expect that to be enough. What uh, and and you said uh, along the lines of you know we didn't want much from our dog until it became a problem and then you wanted it to stop doing the problem behaviors yeah where and the groundwork the stuff that you're just talking about wasn't put in place where you had no communication skills with your dog and you mentioned um you used the word bored with amber mm. they call great you can call him amber <laughs> i don't know if i can call him amber <laughs> um, that's where it all began <laughs> he had identity issues <laughs> um i I find, I don't know, I'll be honest, I don't know if that dog was bored mm -hmm. because I, I think that dog was probably completely lost mm -hmm. and, and and what we'll do when we're uncomfortable is we'll find something that makes us comfortable mm -hmm. and focus in on something. Mm -hmm. So what will happen is that in, in a dog's world like that is he doesn't have the ability to communicate with everybody. He feels lost and confused because nobody around him is helping him. And these items that we put in front of our dogs, we use the word toy um, because we want to sell them and they bring a positive association to us. But these are consistent things in the dog's life. They're pacifiers and comfort items. And with a dog whose external environment is confusing and scary, you will end up with a very low tolerance of change in that environment. And so when somebody picks something up, when somebody moves his bed, when someone interferes with something that he thought was consistent his world breaks down and he has a panic attack yeah and then he defends it yeah and then we tell them off for being aggressive mm -hmm. it's so broken and backwards um and understanding like give our dogs I, I bang on about it on my social media so much about if you make your dog feel safe settled and comfortable mm -hmm. as a priority um that is that's that's the best thing you can ever do for any living thing that you bring into the life our lives because they don't get it they don't understand that we close lock, lock the doors and close the windows and set alarms they're very human things and this sort of thing just goes back to just how to really care for a dog and understanding that communication um with your dog can really just set them up for a win like and those fundamentals you talk about are so important because if you're taking a dog towards or like down the dog park and you're going hey amber and the dog doesn't turn its head around. Well, you don't have recall. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's um, and if you can't communicate verbally with your dog, then maybe you shouldn't be living off the leash. Absolutely not. No. <laughs> yeah. you don't have a, the more physical control you're in, the less control you're in. So if you can't communicate verbally with your dog, like come here, go to bed, stay. I always talk about the five elements of recall: like stay, come here, go over there, a release, like okay. And then my version of no, which is an interruption, mm -hmm. it's just the ability to go or whatever, just break their focus. Yeah. And it puts me in a position to use one of the other four. The rest of it, 
sit and stay, to be honest. I don't really care about in terms of um, for any other reason than to communicate what I want with the dog. But really, what I want is my dog to be coherent. And that's some baseline with dog training. Um, if I'm working with aggression, I'll strip it right back, just like you. Yeah. And for some people, that can be... Um, one of the things that I say to my clients quite regularly, because when I go to see them and I say, well, let's start with the basics. Let's spend the first, you know, first session just going over what what your dog knows and what you can how you can communicate with your dog um i think quite often i have to really um establish how important those basics are those foundations are uh, and for some people i think they're hoping that you're going to come along and tell them something else uh, and i always describe it and compare it to personal training so i know what to do at the gym i know that i need to eat less cakes and chocolate um, and when my trainer tells me that, I go, because mm. I want them to go, oh, here's a magic pill or here's the thing you didn't know and you haven't tried. Um, but what I actually want is for somebody to tell me there's so much information out there and some of it is great and some of it is not so great. Um, but because there's so much, it's really hard to work out what works. And I think you're more inclined to give up if you're not getting an, an immediate result. And so I say the same with the training. You know, you go to the gym and you, you sort of think, oh, I'll lift these weights and I'll run on the treadmill or whatever else. And it only takes your trainer to tell you what order or what sequence to do those things in and how often to trust that you'll get the result. Um, and sometimes that's all you need is someone to say, yeah, you're doing the right stuff, but you're not quite doing it for long enough or you're doing it for too long or you need some more, um, some more of this and some more of that. And so it's very simple stuff. But if you can, if you apply yourself and you actually consistently do it you'll get really great results and it's really for me the, the word consistent is, is huge for me because I think it's easy to go this isn't working he's not listening to me and um, so I'm going to try and do something else and from what I've seen in, at times quite often people will escalate what they're doing so they'll the whistle becomes the scream the clap the jumping and it and it's not working so it's really easy to start losing patience and then start becoming quite um erratic and so it's really important that I have to say to my my clients when we're training if you find yourself getting frustrated that every time you ask your dog to leave the yummy bit of chicken that you put on the floor and he doesn't um and you get annoyed at that then stop training with him there because you've got to be having fun this has got to be good and if you get to the point where you're like damn like he keeps stealing the chicken from me or whatever he's doing then you're not enjoying it anymore and you're putting pressure on it and he will feel that um, and so back off and go away, have a have a break, come back and have fun again. Yeah, I think once you both get frustrated, yes, yeah. no point. I say the same shit. I'm like, just stop because no one's with you here. And yeah. Well, our dogs, our dog's behaviour is a result of what we expose them to. Mm -hmm. So you're the one that put it in that scenario. Mm -hmm. If it can't hear you, then it's in the wrong place, or you're, or you have, or you haven't conditioned that behaviour. Well enough, well enough mm -hmm. to be in that scenario, yeah. and there is no, um, there's nobody holding a gun to your head saying that you've got to go there. Yeah. Everybody's like feels all this pressure to test themselves and their dogs, and they genuinely like test themselves. Like, I've got to go and do this. No, you bloody don't, mate. Slow down. Yeah. Like, if you're if you take your dog into the middle of the dog park and it can't hear you because there's dogs running around, you're setting yourself and your dog up to fail. And then you're the one screaming. Like, yeah. Come back here goes back to, like, why, why do you get the dog to be happy? Why are you screaming at your dog then? Yeah. <laughs> and I would say as well, listen to your tone of your voice. Yeah. So once your voice raises, stop. Yeah. And just go, come here. Come here. Come here. Yeah. <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> what just happened then? Yeah. Listen to your voice. Yeah. No, we're stopping that. It's yeah. not worth it. And I always, you know, when we're talking about uh, training dogs, we're trying to keep them um, coherent. And it goes back down to their arousal level. If they're, if they're overstimulated, then their arousal level goes up. And that's when they're prone to fucking it up and just going all hyper or even aggressive mm -hmm. and all of that. So we? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Bring, uh, <laughs> they're uh, all losing. <laughs> yeah. Like, if you're feeling flustered, then why are you there? Yeah. Like, again, like, it's, the idea is to build tolerance gradually and desensitize gradually, not flood. Yeah. That's what I mean by testing. Like everybody goes, I'm going to go and try and do this today. It's like, you know, fuck that. <laughs> um, there's just no need. Yeah. I like what you just said there about the tolerance because one of the things that I often see with um, very, when I'm doing basic training is, um, you know, if you're asking your dog to, uh, to stay 
and you put them into the position and you say stay and you and you um and everyone starts out the same way i find everyone walks backwards saying stay 25 times stay 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 <laughs> and i and i always chuckle and i say try and say stay less try not to use your voice a little bit less and just maintain some eye contact and things like that um but then what i like to do is break the eye contact so okay let's try it again and let's try um looking at the floor or let's try turning your back and as soon as the back is turned, the dog breaks because they're like, well, I haven't, I haven't tried this yet. This is new to me. And what I try to explain is one of the things that I do all the time and I always freak out my clients is I start doing star jumps or something really weird. So the dog, so the dog goes, whoa, what's going on? Because my point is if you can do weird stuff and your dog is not breaking and it's staying in this position, you're going to be in a better position outside when those unexpected things happen. And people don't really, um, I think, correlate that if you... Yeah, if you start doing really bizarre behaviors, make some sounds, whatever else, it's really about conditioning um, and building the tolerance so that the dog is able to maintain the position and listen to you and not be distracted by the things that are happening around them. Yeah, like um, again, we always try and get people to play it similar. Because um, I always explain like sit, stay, come, and sit, stay, go. They're all linear, like the dog is moving from A to B. There's no C, there's no distraction. There's nothing around it for, for it to, be affected by and my, my the client will go oh it never comes back it comes back really well in the home but never in the dog park yeah um yeah. <laughs> so many cool things in the so, dog park oh god <laughs> dog parks for me are my worst nightmare oh, yeah, really. oh good <laughs> i i cannot stand being near them i become an extremely anxious human being and that's why i try to avoid them because i'm overthinking everything um and so for me if, if for my my advice to my clients who really want to get there they want to get from i've got a puppy now who can go outside to i want them to be able to play in the dog park that's a journey that i think you have to slowly go on and quite often people will put their dog in a position that they're not prepared for and so it can go wrong um, and that's that's for me quite a scary place that I don't have enough control over what's happening in that environment to feel confident that I trust other people's dogs um, and also that I've seen my client's dog in that situation and quite often when they're calling me because their dog is dog aggressive or dog reactive um, they, they, they want me to meet them in the dog park and I say no <laughs> I can't be there because that's not a good, I mean it's a good place to see it in that in action yeah um, but I need but that means um, as a trainer if we're sitting in the dog uh, go and act aggressively. We've set everybody up to fail. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't have a fight with that dog. See, let me see it by well, you. I think that's the one question we always get asked. I think we spoke about this. Um, where should we meet for our consult? Mm -hmm. Like at home? Yeah. yeah. Who's best? Yeah. Not in the park? No. You don't want to see a fight? You want to no. break up a fight? When, when, it, when they go, oh, I'm not sorry, my dog's been really good today. I'm really sorry. I'm like, I have seen so many dogs fuck it up. <laughs> yeah. I do not need to see yours as well. Yeah, like, trust want. me, I know what dogs acting aggressively looks like, yeah, yeah. is caused by, and what to do about it. That's why I do it for a living. Yeah. Um, but, but your dog acting aggressively, like, it, unless, you know, the, the, of course you're trying to figure out if it's like distance increasing or fr leash frustration and all of that, but at the same time, like, I don't really, I don't need to see it get to red zone and level 10 and, no. you know, I don't need to cause your dog a panic attack no. because I really want your dog to really stay under threshold and go back to that building tolerance gradually. Yeah. Because that's teaching people how to read the dog's body language to prevent failure from happening. And because I know damn well that every time your dog reacts that way, it causes you stress because you didn't call me because it was going well. Yeah. Like. It, it's set yourself up for a win, yeah. and don't, and it, this is why corrective measures. Just for me, they set everybody up to fail. Like as an owner, nobody wants to be running around belting their dog with a check chain. And if you do, probably just give your dog someone nicer. Well, this is one of the things that I often think. You know, people who I don't want to get into the conversation too much about aggression and, and around dominance theory and things like that. But I think of behaviour almost like a big spectrum. And I think of the way that we um, approach it also on a spectrum. And there's some people who are using some seriously outdated measures, um, forceful measures, um, fear-based training. And I've always described that as the lazy way. Mm. Right? You will you will probably get a result very quickly because your dog is shit scared of what you just made it do. Um, a client of mine um, once described one of the tactics they used, which was to pin the dog. Um, and that's I'm not a fan, obviously not a fan of that. And and you've got to find a really careful way of saying that to a client who 
doesn't know any better. That's what they've been shown. That's yeah. what they've been told yeah. to do. I've got to be dominant. And the word pack leader is like my no-no. I hate the word. Um, and so I never use it, right? But pinning the dog got the reaction that he wanted very quickly. And the um, the, the other owner in the family didn't do that and wasn't getting the reaction. And I can see how that would appeal. Um, but what you have now is a dog that is frightened of you. You've now incited anxiety into this dog. You are on your way to really nurturing the worst behaviours and making surely you don't want to do that anyway. And what, what happens? I mean, one, they're mistaking, they often mistake respect and fear. Mm. So they'll go, oh, my dog now respects me. I'm no. like, no, it's scarier. It's terrible, but say, for example, and typically this is, this is a very typical general example, but it's the male in the relationship that can pin. And it just leaves the, their, their own partner, their, their own person that they love the most, feeling helpless and useless because they can't pin. Yeah. So they're actually creating a divide in their own family. Yeah. And one, it's a terrible way of dog training, but two, it's a terrible way of just, family's meant to be tight and yeah. built out of love and trust. And um, there'll be, end up being a lot of finger pointing. I've, mm -hmm. I've seen it so many times. It's yeah. a lot of finger pointing, like, why can't you do this? Well, why... What, why are you setting everybody up to fail? You're setting your dog up to fail and your partner up to fail. Yeah. Um, and sure, if it's not the man, then sure. But typically, that's what we see. Yeah, and in this scenario, it was. And um, and, and in this scenario, the dog was then what they would describe, oh, he walks all over her. But he was um, more comfortable with her. He avoided the male. Mm. Um, and so I can see how, but the problem is as well, when you go down that path, that path of using force, and if the dog is a bold dog, a brave dog or you know, a specific breed perhaps, they might not respond to the initial pin or whatever that behavior is. And you have no choice then in your world but to escalate that. Before you know it, you've got your dog in a headlock and you're doing something great. Like it's not healthy. Yeah, you can right. only go one way. You've gone down a very dangerous path and it's a ticking time bomb. And I've experienced that firsthand. We would take on Amber Pickle or Amber Pick as he sometimes was affectionately known. We would take him on with, um, with objects. If he was attacking, um, he attacked me. And we, we would be kind of trying to like, almost fend him off like a lion, you know, with like a lion tamer with a chair, trying to get him away from us because he was he was just freaking out. Um, and we had no skills in, to be able to deal with that. And the problem is once you're trying to take challenge him in that situation, you have to keep, you almost have to feel that you have to win and it's not right. Yeah. One of the questions I get regularly, I don't know how you guys feel about this, but I get the question about playing tug of war. Mm. I should never let my dog win tug. And I'm like, I'm, I don't have the patience to sit and hold on and, and beat this dog at times. Like, if it's a puppy, it's not trying to dominate you with no. tug. It's not going to correlate those two. And that's my opinion. I don't think it's a problem. So I say, let the dog win tug. It's, you know, otherwise you're in a... I use um, play as a uh, way of creating communication skills under high arousal. Yeah. So movement triggers the adrenaline. And so we invite the dog on. And then if you're going to, and then we teach a release. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the game, the, the, the reward for playing is keep the toy and go and play around with it. Yeah. yeah. And um, you'll notice how quick they get so tired. If you, five minutes of tug, you know, tug, 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 sit. Yeah. Okay, go get it. Yeah. Bring it back, tug, tug, tug. Yeah. Out. Sit. Lie down. Okay, go get it. And their brain's thinking, and they're like, oh my gosh. And yeah. at the end, you give them the tug, and they go, come down. Don't get me wrong, yeah. I think tug of war can absolutely set people up to fail. Yeah, absolutely. Because if you just tug, 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 yeah. tug, 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 and never ask for a, hey, can you settle and relax and release? Yeah. Then you're, the way you interact with your dog is setting up communication skills with your dog. And play is a conversation, it's a series of invites and backups. And if your dog doesn't understand, hey, give me a moment, mm -hmm. because you've never engaged with it that way, um, how is it meant to learn? Yeah. And then, of course, people jump to that back to that conclusion. He's not giving up. I've got to tell him off. <laughs> yeah. You never but trained it. Right. It's kind of like ball throwing as well. Oh, it's just repetitive throwing. There's no communication. No. It's just go get it. Go get it. Go get it. Go get it. One of my um, one of my first clients. <laughs> it was the best dog in the world. Um, she had a. Dachshund mixed with a staffy. So this dog was a little what? small bullet, like a wombat, right? It was, thick, <laughs> it was strong. I'm trying to it was short. This. Was it like, can you explain? It, it looked like, like dashy legs or was it? Yeah, like... dashy legs, staffy body, and like a bit of a, a bit of a doggo face. Like it wasn't like a staffy face, it was a long nose. 
I've got I've got videos. Oh my God. This dog, right, was the best dog in the world. But it was a nightmare because the poor owner, um, she would go to the park with her dog and her dog would um steal balls, right? Or toys. But she could get like three in her mouth at once. So she would run around the park and just nick everyone's balls and toys. And then the entire park would chase this dog and she'd be like, Game on, I'm a bullet, I can run as fast as I can with my little legs. You're not going to get me. And she would absolutely love it. And for the first few times I was there, I was like, God, I don't know how to deal with this because I can't catch this dog. And I stupidly got brave and said, let's test it out. She got the ball. We chased her for an hour um, until she <laughs> tired. And then we were like, victory. But really, it wasn't. So we've been practicing that unwanted <laughs> behavior for an hour. She was loving it. <laughs> she had a great time. Um, and this dog was such a sweet, lovely dog, but she was terrible at it. And people had sometimes said to the to the owner, I'll just keep the ball. Like she is how many she never had to buy toys because she, her dog would steal people's toys. Um and we we had such a good time chasing the dog around, but eventually we had to gain some control and we used a really long lead mm. and we um we negotiated with the with the dog. And some people don't have the patience for negotiation and I think it's the most important thing. And we took we raised the roof whenever she would drop that ball and she we'd go, Yeah, and we get very excited. Um, but try not to be too excited that she gets so excited she grabs the ball. And she also did that typical thing where she puts the ball down and as you go to grab it, she grabs it again and runs away. So she's like, ha, psych, you can't have it. Um, but she was such good fun and such a good fun problem to deal with. Um, and she got so much better. But the point was, because she wasn't yet, because it was so habitual that she got such a rush out of getting this ball and being chased, um, we need to control this dog, and so unfortunately, um, you've got to have her on a long leash for a while so you can gain control back because you can't have a stealing object. You said something key there. It's so like uh, people aren't prepared to negotiate. Mm -hmm. That's because they have been so stressed from putting themselves in that situation that their tolerance is so low mm -hmm. that they don't have the energy to put into communication. But they've still somehow managed to find the energy to go and set up to bail and then getting this war of attrition with their dog every time they're there. Mm -hmm. It's like, you'll go, if you want this situation to go well, stop doing what you've been doing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like... What do they say about when you do... It's always, repeating yeah, Einstein's the definition of insanity. Yeah. yeah. Repeating um, the same thing yeah. over and over and hoping for a different result. Yeah. Yeah. So going to the park in a and creating new patterns of behaviour and uh, it will get you new patterns of behaviour. Yeah. But going to the park and you willing it not to go wrong, but <laughs> still doing exactly the same thing, that's what you see. Yeah, <laughs> self-fulfilling prophecy, isn't it, really? Yeah. Um, one of the things that I wanted to really kind of circle around to was um, to talk about rescue dogs, because one of the things I think is really um, difficult when you make the decision to go and rescue a dog is when you have a puppy, you get to, for one thing, you get to take the responsibility of molding that puppy and... You get to um, you know really play a part in, in developing its personality and it's 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 changing its life and behaviors, um, and it's really difficult with a with a rescue to it's not difficult actually it's it's not difficult at all but people think it's difficult. Um, one of the things that I observed when I worked at the RSPCA was um, there's often there was often a feeling from my from our clients that the dog. Um, must have been abused or has been through something terrible and therefore they allow the dog to have certain behaviours um, it was almost a guilt thing right? so they would get their dog and they'd be like oh but, he, he, but we think he's been abused because he, he, you know, he cowers a little bit or he panics in some way um, we did have abuse cases at times but they were treated very differently they, they didn't live in the main section with all the other dogs because often they were under um, criminal proceedings and things like that but it's actually um, the wrong assumption to make or to apply it. It might be that a dog's been through some, some really rough handling or some, had a bad experience, but I think a lot of people lean to that as the reason why yeah. it behaves a certain way um, and see it as something that they can't overcome because the dog's damaged. Yeah. Um, and I think that that can sometimes hold us back in success because people are then unable to, um, to really see the potential in the dog. I think, um, I think that's a really good point. Something... Um you know, I, I always look at it this way. Like, so, like you say, they jump to that conclusion. That, say, for example, they're walking down the street and they walk past a guy in a floral jacket and the dog winces or cowers or, you know, barks aggressively. And we jump to the conclusion that, oh, it's had this life that I don't know about. It's probably had, uh, maybe it's been abused by a man in a floral jacket. Mm -hmm. um, maybe. 
I mean, it, 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 you don't know. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, but the likelihood is not that high, realistically. Like, it's not that high. And what we're probably dealing with is a dog that's been presented with information that it's got no coping skills for. Yeah. It's seen it and panicked. Mm -hmm. And let's be honest, it doesn't matter why. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. you are, all you've got to do is kind of condition it either way. Yeah. So then you go, okay, this, listening to my dog's body language, my dog is now communicating that it finds this particular stimulus stressful. Kind of condition it, make it positive. Yeah. Regardless of why, yeah. it makes no difference. Yeah. Yeah. I think we like, as humans, we like to understand that we want to know the root cause of something. Yeah. And more so than ever with dog training, I get it all the time. Why do you think she does this? Why, why is she, you know, and you guys talked on it, I think, in the last podcast or the one before, but it was things like um, they're stubborn or they're spiteful. Um, but other times it's just, you know, they, they, we love to attribute um, human qualities with our animals and that's really normal and like you know you've discussed it already it's not the same it's not like for like emotional spectrums are different um but i think it's 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 important that when you regardless of whether it's a puppy or a rescue um there's a bunch of stuff that i often say to my clients around um the first time you switch on the vacuum cleaner the first time you the doorbell rings one of the things that most of my clients have issues with is the dog's reaction to the doorbell or when somebody's at the front door, and I always describe the front door as this vortex of amazingness, right? So the dog, for the dog, I go through that door and I get to be in the outside world, it's amazing. Every time that door opens, somebody amazing comes in. And so this door becomes just this obsessive, kind of amazing like portal to something wonderful. And it means that then it becomes really hyper excited. When the doorbell rings, it's a trigger, right? It's enough to make them go, whoa, the door's gone, something great's about to happen, someone's coming in. And so, what we don't do is we don't consider those things before we um, expose our dog to them. And so what I like to do is say to people, start to condition your dog slowly to the things that you think are normal. You might think it's okay to walk down the street and have a you know, a giant truck drive past you and it doesn't frighten you, but when you're you know, a third of the size that you are and that happens, that can be scary, especially the first time you see it. So um, start to think about all the things that could potentially frighten your dog and how you can then handle that because there's nothing worse than a dog that is not able to enjoy the outside world and go on a great walk and is spending the entire time terrified of all these things that they once got exposed to and and now yeah. just uh want to just clear something up there as well it's really really accurate um but uh one of the things that i think this can confuse people a lot as well is you know um we it's adrenaline Mm. It's arousal, whether it's fearful or whether it's uh, really, really exciting is irrelevant in the sense that it is just an adrenaline state and the body doesn't know the difference. Mm -hmm. It's the same. I see the front door slight, slightly different mm -hmm. because I, I believe that well, survival says treat everything as a threat until they can be sure otherwise. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes when you go out that door, it is really, really positive. Like going for a walk, for example, mm -hmm. front door is really associated with positive things. Someone coming to the door is a threat until they know otherwise. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's your best friend, family member. Sometimes it's delivery with a big helmet. And it's an adrenaline state rather than amazingness, in mm -hmm. my opinion. Yeah. Because it is unknown. Yeah. And that doorbell gets triggered and all of a sudden you're seeing an adrenal response. That's all. And you go... Uh, and then sometimes you see the dog go, oh, Christ, you're wearing a helmet and I'm going to move away. And then sometimes you see the overexcited, um, almost relief. Oh, thank God it's you. Oh, shit. Yeah. Oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. Like, I think um, the front door is probably the biggest point of arousal in anyone's home. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. saying, like, we try and counter condition it. And we, um, with that, you know, people go, oh, my dog's not doing it. And the same sort of, exactly the same, we circle back around, like, what are you doing about it? Because the front door puts us on autopilot. Mm -hmm. We forget that as soon as that doorbell rings, every single one of us, our adrenaline levels go up. Mm. And until, unless we know someone's coming, mm -hmm. yeah. we, we actually that. forget that, oh, shit, who is it, who is it, who is it, who is it? And it makes us nervous, but we also don't forget, as soon as somebody rings a doorbell, our brain does jump to the conclusion that at least they've got the etiquette to not break in. <laughs> um, it's it's an adrenaline response, yeah. and so, but it what well, I'm getting at. Sorry, it puts us on an autopilot. We hear it, we stand up, we start initiating movement, we start going toward the door. We then open the door, then we introduce noise. Hey, how you doing? Then we introduce more movement into the house. Yeah. 
it is trigger after trigger after trigger after trigger yeah. and wonder why our dogs are overstimulated. Yeah, I often um, describe it as a uh, almost like a scale from zero to five um, and imagine that when like, those things start to happen one by one, um, you, you're climbing up that scale and you're getting more and more stimulated in, in whatever way, whether that's, you know, I think we attribute the words fear and excitement and amazingness to, to, yeah. to the spectrum, but really it's just a spectrum, it's just feeling. Um, and I often say try and keep that as low as possible. But you're right there, you know, if the door goes, often we, we're expecting it, right? So if, if the doorbell rings, if we're not expecting it, then we all look at each other and go, what the hell is this? Yeah. This time of night? You know, like, you, you almost yourself experience the same thing. It's like, a, it's, it's, it's a question mark. But for a dog, every time that door goes, they're not expecting it to go. Uh, and they're very sensitive to small, subtle things. You know, Amber Pickle was able to, I've got to a point where he, he knew how to spell shoes because that's how we had to describe going to the park. We would say, mum would say, go get your shoes on. And the dog knew what that meant. So he would eventually get quite excited. So we had to say, go get your S-H-O-E-S's on. And eventually he knew what that meant. And obviously he's not spelling, but he's starting to pick up on the sound, the tone. It's a pattern. It meant that when we said that thing, he went outside and he was very um, sensitive to small, subtle things like that. And so even somebody walking to the door your dog has probably got a, a, an idea of that happening way before you have, whether they can pick it up with smell, whether they can hear it. Um, and so it's things like that that we underestimate, that we just know is normal in our life. The vacuum cleaner and the hairdryer for me are two big things. And if you have a doorbell, is um, try to expose your um, your dog to that quite early on because if it just happens, usually the doorbell goes and you just go into autopilot like you've just said, and you start um, going to the door and you're not even thinking about how your dog's reacting. And if it's if it if it's if it's getting really stimulated by this, which it probably will, you will not notice a habit start to begin um, to creep in. And so I've had clients who every time the doorbell goes, the dog goes crazy and starts biting at their ankles, and the, and I got quite a bite from the dog. Just a small little pomeranian can do some damage, um, uh, biting me for walking in, and and even the movement, me moving, it was just by the time that I'd rang the buzzer, got in the lift, all this time was going on where this dog. Is predicting probably that I'm about something's about to happen. It's, like pressure cooker. it's just yeah. building up, and then it's like, oh my god, let me get your ankles. And so I would come in, and, and I would become the chew toy for this dog. And and all this time, the owner's trying to talk to me, and I keep saying, ignore me. I am not here. Just let, just don't greet me right now. We've just got to deal with things one by one. And so on our first console, I spent the whole time down and up and down in that lift, just ringing that bell, ringing that bell. Okay, let's come back up, and then just kind of trying to condition. Um, and so the small things like that, I think, whether you're a pup, getting a puppy or whether you're getting a rescue, um, you need to think about about that in advance. Um, and one of the things that I really am passionate about is that transition from shelter life into into the home. Um, quite often when a dog has gone from a home to a shelter, they regress because they're in a really um, unnatural situation. They're in an environment that is highly stress yeah. stressful. And so you are probably going to in inherit a dog with some extra bad habits that they didn't have at the start because they often lose toilet training. Um, they're often now reactive dogs to people approaching kennels. They bark a lot, things like that. And so um, you've got your work cut out for you and it's the most re rewarding thing. But for the first few weeks of having a rescue, it can be so hard and you can question whether you've made the right choice, whether you're cut out for it. And you are. You just need to have some basics and you need to have some support. And it's not something I think you can just wing it. You yeah, have yeah. to really apply a plan. What's your sort of best tips for bringing a rescue? Like yeah. Your top five tips to bring your rescue back. Your so one thing that I really want to encourage people to do is instead of, um, first of all, when you're choosing a rescue dog, if you can go to a shelter that helps match you to a dog before you start browsing the catalogue as it would be, try to not go with those that, that gorgeous dog with those big eyes and don't let that be enough to, to get you going. I read an article recently about how dogs have been um, genetically evolving so that they're more appealing to us. Their eyes are getting bigger and browner and it just makes our hearts melt. But you really need to think with your head and you need to think about what your lifestyle is like and how you're willing to change it. Because if you get a high energy dog, dog and you're not ready for that, or you get a specific breed, a working breed, for example, and you don't have the experience, you need to do the research. Um, so I would advise people, if they can help it, to try and let their heads grow. I'd even do online research or even contact a shelter and say, I'm looking for a dog that's like, like this, you know, it's low energy, I'm looking for a senior, whatever you're looking for, and ask them for some help. 
Um, when I worked at the shelter, we did that. We would often say to people who were very interested in taking a specific dog that we knew would be a challenge, we're not ready for you to take this dog yet, so we're going to make you come in every week for the next three weeks and spend at least an hour you know, getting to know this dog. You need to know everything about it because we can't have him or her rehomed and brought back. We can't have a boomerang dog. And quite often that would happen because they would get a dog and then go, Jesus, this is too hard. Um, so for one is really doing your research, taking your time. This isn't an impulse buy. This isn't a pair of shoes. This isn't you know something you see and go, I'll take it. Don't yeah. be panicked by the fact that there's a cute dog that you want or a small dog. You've got to really take your time with this choice. It's a big choice. And you've got to, it's not about you, really. It's about whether you can give this dog the right life. Um, so that's a big one for me. Another one is actually contacting um, a trainer in advance. So I think there's a bit of work to be done around the first day when they move into the home, even preparing the home for a puppy, for example. We know puppies will be into everything and you'll find out how clean your house is when you Super get a puppy. Fast. <laughs> because you start going, what the hell's in its, in its mouth? You know, um, And same with shelter dogs. I think you need to think about the transition into the home. Where are they going to sleep on the first night? How much of the premises should we give them access to? Where's going to be the bathroom and how close is it to their bed? Because sometimes they've spent X amount of time sleeping and peeing in the same spot, really. Um, so things like that, there's a strategy you need to consider. Um, and so I think it's very helpful to reach out to a trainer and say, I'm getting a rescue. Can you give me any idea how I go about preparing the home for day one, day two, what, and what to expect? I think, and then getting into a very quick routine. You've got to give the dog time. You've got to give them a quiet space. You've got to make sure everything's gradual and not overwhelming, but also be ready to start getting stri straight into action with some new boundaries. You know, and Ian, you mentioned it before about the family. Um, it's important that before that dog arrives in your house that you all sit down and you agree how you're going to raise this dog and that you all agree that you're on the same wavelength. I've had so many um, couples having almost a powwow in front of me because well, you, you never let, you let it get away with this and you let it jump on the couch and I don't want it to. And they don't align in their requirements for what they want from their dog. And so it's important that that happens beforehand and it doesn't become an ad hoc thing. Yeah. You know, it should be a discussion and agreement at, at, up front. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think money as well. A lot of people, dogs, dogs are expensive. Mm -hmm. um, you need to be able to have the funds to feed them, the vet bills, food, grooming. So that's a really big consideration as well. And also that they're for life too, you know, 10 to 15 years of your life yeah. you're going to have this dog for. So consider what you're doing with the next 10 to 15 years of your life because you know, it's a, a family member in the end. Yeah. yeah. And taking it back to just a second ago, you were talking about the first few weeks. We, um, we actually asked people to look at the first three months mm -hmm. because there's 12, 12 weeks. It's working working life like your dog's trying to predict patterns um it's been through the mill like you say from a home to a rescue maybe a foster home um maybe it's move rescues and then even when it comes into yours it's then anticipating more change it doesn't know that you're going to be looking after it forever so a dog that has been experiencing change is now going to be anticipating change and that's where it goes back to, for the first three months, don't ask it to run before it can walk, mm. figuratively or literally. <laughs> yeah. um, make it, go back to that, make it feel safe. Yeah. Because yeah. if you yeah. strip that back and make it really, really, really comfortable, problem behavior is driven by hyperarousal, stress, fear, anxiety. They don't present. And in, we see it so often where people get the dog and they bring it out and they throw it in the deep end and all of these things happen and again, it's like the opposite reason why you brought that dog into your life. Yeah. It just yeah. doesn't need to be that way. And often it can be hard because we don't know what we don't know. I really hate that saying because I hear it every day at work. But we don't, and, and, and owners don't know what they don't know. And that's why it's so important to, to not just presume that you've got this and you can just do it yourself. Um, you can, and people are very capable and very intelligent. But I also think sometimes it just helps to run it past someone. And I don't know any trainers that wouldn't help somebody if they said, look, I, I, I don't want to bring you on just yet, but I'm just, I need some help, some guidance, some advice. Yeah. I'm always happy to give advice. I'm probably the opposite. I'm probably always giving too much advice and, and, and thinking to myself, I should actually offer you training, but instead I'm just giving you too many um, tips. But I do think it's important that we, um, that people are able to reach out and get, and be able to trust somebody um, and, and be able to ask questions and, and not feel that it's um, you know it's a sales pitch or that they've got to then be um, 
obligated to take me on as a trainer. So I'm often finding people contact me to say, hey, can you give me some tips and advice? You know, I'm thinking about getting a, um, a border collie. Yeah, and this is where actually a good, um, good time to raise this and we'll add, be adding you to this as well. Um, we've got the Healthy Dog Pod uh, support group mm -hmm. um, on Facebook. Yeah. And there is myself, Sophie, Nikki, mm -hmm. um, and a couple of other trainers involved where you can reach out and actually ask a trainer for just some advice. Now, if we can help, we will. If it's a really complex issue, of course, and please understand that we will try. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, there is, we've touched on this in the past in previous episodes where we've talked about, you know, going on Facebook and putting a post up and then giving free advice from the random public. Probably not the best place to go. Yeah. While it might be free, you are potentially setting it yourself up. That's for... a tough one. There was um, actually a post recently where someone told um, someone else that they should give their dog urine for pain relief. Holy shit. And the dog actually passed away. Oh my god. Yeah, it would. Yeah. Um, it's a liver. It, yeah. Yeah, it went all yellow and it was awful. But it, it's tough because, you know, we all get dogs. We all have dogs. We all have dogs our whole lives. And, but sometimes you just need advice from professionals. Well, I mean, that's it. We've almost got to the point where we are more willing to go online and to Dr. Google and not actually call the doctor at the local veterinary surgery. If you call the vets and said and some ideas around how to, you know, manage pain, um, they, they, there's a reason why that's not something that you can just go and buy over the counter. There's no, you know, you've got to go and speak to professionals about that stuff. You know, that's, it. That, that's, that's shocking. Yeah. Wow. That's crazy. I, I think... I think that um, when it comes to rescues in particular, but I think with any dog, um, it's it's for me it's really about having it's preparing and it's about making sure that you go into that with your your head in the game um, and not making those let's like say those impulsive decisions um, because those are the ones that you're going to be stuck with. Um, but if you have gone ahead and made that decision, or if you've gone ahead and got a rescue dog, um, and you haven't you know had the time to plan this ahead it's not too late it doesn't matter you know that old fable of you can't teach an old dog new tricks well that's that's nonsense to me i think you can um Absolutely. you can change behaviors you um you just need to observe them a bit more predict them interrupt them find alternative ways to um to stimulate that animal in certain ways and and it's all about the positivity um but one thing i just wanted to mention was um one thing i'm quite passionate about is that sometimes i think when i mention the spectrum of how we approach on the one end, there's the, the, the bad side. On the, on the other end, there's a really great positive side. And in between there, there's also some work to be done around setting boundaries and standards um, in a way that is not, it's not, sometimes you can do positive reinforcement. Most of the time you should and always should. But there's, um, there's sometimes where that's not going to work. So I have a client who's got, who's great positive reinforcement. This dog has teeth like needles. And she will chew on a bare foot. She loves it. She'll she, if you've got no socks on, she's after your toes. Um, and all the positive reinforcement in the world for when she stops chewing on your toe is great. But the problem is, she wants to play. It's more rewarding than <laughs> any reward you can give her. Especially when I squeal and yelp because she just took a big chunk out of my little toe. Um, and she kind of gets a kick out of that, and she she finds it quite fun. Um, and what my clients were finding hard was how do I how do I tell her no? without it being forceful and aggressive. Where's the balance? You know, where's, where's the, there's the positive, that's a great job. How do I tell her it's a bad job and it be enough? So they tried a bunch of stuff, times out, they tried to leave the room, they said no, Stanley. This is a quite a bold dog. And if you're ever to attribute some kind of cheeky human um, persona to this dog, this is the one. She gets a real kind of play bow into her. If you start trying to challenge her, when she's attacking your foot, she, she'll she love it. She'll really get into a play. Well, that's it. Like, but let's. So let's be clear, she's not she's not being bought, uh, naughty as such. <laughs> what she's doing is let's figure out what the reward is for the dog. Yeah. And it was to make you move and to engage her. <laughs> yeah. And as soon as you start going no and challenging her, she got the reward she wanted. Yeah. <laughs> but you know what's really challenging is I um and, and we got there eventually with this dog, but when I tried to ignore her, she bit me harder. <laughs> yeah. yeah, part of the extinction burst. Yeah. 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 Because I mean we've talked about can we say no in the past? Um and it's uh it's interesting because we we've said this as well in the past, like where if you render the client powerless by saying no when you say you can't say no, and then they end up getting frustrated and correcting. Mm -hmm. And going back into the whole 
over the top. Yeah. So, so it's like you say, it's about actually getting it right. And the earlier you can catch it, the better, because then you prevent the dog from being overstimulated, keep it in a better frame of mind for learning and training. But at the same time, just an actual disagreement, which doesn't cause fear mm -hmm. and panic, uh, is so important because as soon as I go ah, ah, to my dog, I've, I've said no. Yeah, yeah. And I feel like anybody that doesn't understand that's a mom. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, hey, I've, I've had enough. Back off. Yeah. yeah. And I tell you what, as soon as you say to somebody, no, you can't tell me that, you've got to talk me around it. Yeah. Yeah, that's so annoying. It's too hard, and that's where people then take the shortcut. Yeah, that's what I mean. And go yeah. for the the easier yet also very detrimental um, techniques. So yeah. that's yeah, that's always a risk as well. And on the other end of the scale, with the positive, um, like a reward doesn't mean it has to be lose your shit like real super positive. Like <laughs> you're just like oh, boy, well done. Instead of yeah, oh my <laughs> god, calm down. <laughs> like, <laughs> that won't you there you go. No way. Yeah, I mean, but. It's uh, it doesn't. It's just be normal. Create normal yeah. communication patterns with your dog. Um, yeah. Yes and no. Yeah. Like, real simple, but teach. Um, and that's the big underlying message that I'm getting from you as a trainer, which is really cool. Is you create really you're a big believer in like prevention is better than cure and creating communication patterns as to what I, what I would like from my dog and reward that and set everybody up for a win. It's yeah. like a great training method. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> Two seconds. Oh, sure, to wrap it up. Well, awesome. Thanks so much for coming in. Um, really appreciate it and uh, all the today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's been really informative. Thank you so much. Um, and let us know how we can reach you as well. Yeah. I will. So anyone who wants to reach out to me, if you head to um, www.citydogtraining.com, um, I'm also on Instagram and on Facebook. Nice. Yeah, cool. Well, I'll leave your feedback below and your comments. And remember, folks, a healthy dog's a happy dog. Woo! And that was the pod.